type in your questions. You can submit questions at any time during the presentation and we will get to them at the end. Now I'm going to turn it over to Robin Adams who is going to introduce our two speakers. Thank you, Kathy. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to introduce uh, two of our speakers today. The first speaker is Dr. Ali Khan. Dr. Khan earned his medical degree from Lahore Medical and Dental College in Pakistan and completed his internal medicine residency at Mount Sinai St. Luke's and Mount Sinai West Hospitals in New York City. He subsequently pursued specialization in gastroenterology at the United Health Services in Binghamton, New York. Dr. Khan is a board certified gastroenterologist and hepatologist, and his clinical interests include general gastroenterology, inflammatory bowel disease, liver disease, and endoscopy. I'd next like to introduce Dr. Craig Rizak. Dr. Rizak attended Pisa Medical School in Pisa, Italy. He completed his residency at the Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital with the University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey. After residency, Dr. Reza completed fellowships in colorectal surgery at the University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey and in minimally invasive surgery at Hackensack University Hospital. Dr. Reza is board certified and fellowship trained as a colorectal surgeon with over 25 years of experience. He is also the director of EHC's robotic surgery program which has served, which has earned accreditation as a center of excellence. So with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Khan to begin the presentation. Hello everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, Robin, for the introduction. And thank you all for joining the uh, Healthy Aging webinar. So today we're gonna to talk about inflammatory bowel disease. Um, <clears throat> some of the outline of our discussion today is to discuss what is inflammatory bowel disease, what are the subtypes, Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, uh, what are the major differences, and how we as clinicians diagnose this, and what are the medical endoscopic uh, management um, options we have for patients, and, and are, what's the outcomes that we're expecting. So <clears throat> IBD, inflammatory bowel disease, it's a common name used to describe two distinct conditions, uh, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. It's an autoimmune disorder, so, and it's where the body's own immune system attacks healthy, normal tissue. We characterize this as a long-term condition, a chronic condition. It's not uh, something that resolves, and it can lead to complications like strictures, uh, which are narrowing of the colon wall, fistulas, which are abnormal tracts between different organs, and a whole manifestation of complications. And some of the symptoms that we see with patients can be abdominal pain, diarrhea, rectal bleeding, um, weight loss, and <clears throat> malnutrition as well. So we don't really know what causes inflammatory bowel disease, and it seemed to be there's a lot of different risk factors at play. Genetic susceptibility, uh, we have seen where patients with IBD, about 5 to 20% of patients have a first-degree relative with the condition. Uh, we also see environmental triggers, patients with history of gastrointestinal infections, uh, people who eat uh, foods rich in processed foods, smoking, um, urban areas, these all have been shown to be risk factors for inflammatory bowel disease. And then there, we, we have been starting to see more recently that there may be an imbalance of the gut bacteria um, in our colon and intestine, and there may be um, a defective immune response from this. <clears throat> So what are, how, how many people have IBD? So we're starting to see that IBD has been increasing globally uh, over the last 20, 30 years. And from some statistics, IBD was present in about 3.7 million people in 1990. And as most recently in 2017 was noted to be about 6.8 million people. In the United States, about two to three million Americans have the condition, about 0.7% of the population. And every year we diagnose 70,000 new cases um, in the United States. Uh, 
Uh, this is a graph, a diagram showing the global prevalence of the disease. Uh, this was uh, the study from 1990 to 2017. And the areas in red uh, are where the higher prevalence is. So you can see here the United States, the United Kingdom, uh, Scandinavia, these areas were very high in prevalence, while uh, Africa, Asia, the areas noted in blue, are uh, have lower prevalence of inflammatory bowel disease. So at what age does this condition occur? And we start, we notice that the highest peak is usually younger populations, so age from ages 15 to 30. Uh, but the reality is that we are seeing conditions of IBD start up at any, at, at any age group. Some studies, uh, like the study shown here on the right, uh, is kind of an older study which showed that there may be a slight bimodal age distribution, which means that the condition starts to dip in the 20s, 30s, 40s, but we see a second peak uh, of, of uh, this disease starting up between the ages of 50 and 80. There are ethnic and racial differences. Um, Caucasians have shown to have higher prevalence of this disease in comparison to Africans, Hispanics, or Asians. But newer data starting to show that people who are migrating to Western countries, industrialized nations, they're having a similar incidence rates suggesting that environment, lifestyle probably is playing a major role for this. So we discussed briefly what some of the, what are the major symptoms uh, that a patient with IBD may have. And a lot of these symptoms may overlap with a lot of other gastrointestinal conditions. So most commonly abdominal pain, We'll see diarrhea, chronic diarrhea, rectal bleeding, uh, fatigue. Some people complain of brain fog, appetite changes. And these things, if they're going on for a long period of time, can lead to long-term complications such as anemia, malnutrition. And as discussed before, it can lead to issues such as strictures and abscesses and fistula formations. What's interesting about inflammatory bowel disease is because it's a kind of a chronic autoimmune condition, it can lead to manifestations in different organs as well outside of the GI tract. And we see this most commonly in the joints. People can develop arthritis. They can develop rashes on their skin, uh, ulcers in the mouth, and even inflammation of the eyes. In some conditions are even associated with the abnormalities of the biliary tract. What's interesting is that in inflammatory bowel disease, sometimes these extra intestinal manifestations can occur even before you actually develop inflammation in your gut. So what's the major difference? What is Crohn's? What is ulcerative colitis? And in this diagram here, you can kind of get some idea. Uh, <clears throat> the areas that are noted in red show the areas of inflammation. And on the right side, uh, which is ulcerative colitis, you can see that it's kind of a continuous pattern uh, involving the large colon. While in on the left with Crohn's disease, you can see that it has kind of a patchy distribution. We see some involvement in around the in the large colon, and you can see some involvement in the small bowel as well. So this brings us to what's the major differences. So ulcerative colitis is a condition that usually is involved just in the colon and the rectum, while Crohn's disease can start from anywhere from the mouth and go all the way down to the anus. The Crohn's disease causes a much more um, uh, robust uh, inflammation where it usually involves the entire thickness of the intestinal lining, while ulcerative colitis usually just involves the innermost layer. And as we saw in the previous diagram, ulcerative colitis is usually a very continuous inflammation, while Crohn's disease can be very patchy. Because of the significant inflammation in Crohn's, you can develop the, these complications, as we discussed earlier, strictures and fistulas, while in ulcerative colitis, you can develop a condition like toxic megacolon, where you have a very enlarged colon that just stops functioning. And both of these conditions are associated with, as discussed earlier, extra intestinal manifestations. So how do we diagnose this? So it can be a difficult diagnosis to make because there's no single test we have that diagnoses IBD. 
Sometimes the presentation and the symptoms may overlap with other conditions, infections, or other kind of GI tract abnormalities. So we have to use a combination of colonoscopy, endoscopy, stool specimens, sometimes using CT or MRI imaging and blood work to really kind of say that, hey, yes, this is inflammatory bowel disease. So this is a, it's a diagram showing what we usually sometimes see during colonoscopies. And for us as clinicians, we, this is for a patient with ulcerative colitis, we can kind of risk stratify them based on how severe the findings are. So on the left, you can see a normal colon. It looks nice and pink. You can see the vasculature of the tissue. But as you progress towards the right, you start to see that the vasculature starts to disappear. The colon starts to look more and more swollen. And on the right, it just is severely ulcerated, inflamed, and narrow. And this scoring system is, we call it the Mayo scoring system. These are colonoscopy images for Crohn's disease. So as discussed, Crohn's disease is patchy. And you can see here on the top left of the, the picture that there's areas of inflammation and then in between there's areas of normal tissue. And in Crohn's disease, uh, you'll see these small areas of just ulcerations kind of scattered all throughout the colon. Sometimes Crohn's disease can only involve the small intestine, and that can be difficult for us to see with a regular colonoscope or endoscope. So we have to use this uh, device called a pill camera, which is a small capsule that has cameras attached to it that can go through the entire small bowel and look for any kind of inflammation. And in this patient who used a pill cam, you can see that there's areas of ulceration, inflammation, uh, in the small bowel, and this helps us diagnose uh, Crohn's disease. So how do we manage these patients? And every, it's a kind of a step-up approach we have. There's a, there's a whole plethora of medications, and our goal is basically to try as minimally aggressive as possible to get the disease under control. We can use single agents, we can use combination agents, and if medical therapy doesn't work, then we have to kind of resort to surgery to remove the, infect the inflamed segments. So our, our goals are um, that what, what are we trying to achieve when we're starting medical treatment for these patients? So there's two major things we, we look at. One is to how are we going to induce remission and this basically means that we want to turn off the inflammation. We want patients to start feeling well, improving their quality of life. We want lab work to show minimal signs of inflammation, and we want them to get better, uh, patients to keep uh, doing well in terms of growth, development, and nutrition. And once we're able to induce remission, then the goal is to kind of maintain remission. And we want them over long, patients to be over long-term to have stable disease, they don't have any kind of relapses or require recurrent bouts of steroids. And our job as clinicians is to make sure we monitor these patients on regular intervals. We make sure that there's no signs of early relapse and then do major uh, general health management in terms of making sure that we can prevent infections, do cancer screening, um, and basically make sure that they're doing well. This is a table. It shows the <clears throat> different medications we have. Um, the most, uh, the earliest, well, like, or one of the most uh, safer medications is these topical anti-inflammatory medications, uh, aminosalicylates, uh, also called like mesalamine. These come in different formulations. You can give oral tablets, suppositories, enemas, and they reduce inflammation and they're great for mild uh, disease. Um, steroids are frequently used for patients with IBD, and the reason is usually for, to treat flares. And we try to limit the use of steroids because they have a lot of side effects, and we try as, <clears throat> to use as short treatment of a duration as possible. Antibiotics are used, uh, usually if there is any infection on top of the disease, and if there's any collections uh, such as abscesses or a fistula. 
Um, and some of these other these medicate the other medications we have for IBD are immunosuppressant therapies, and um, some of them are, for instance, azathioprine, methotrexate. And what these do is to basically reduce inflammation uh, throughout the body to kind of suppress this um, inflammatory sequence of events. And these are usually reserved for more moderate to severe disease. More recently, in the last, I would say about 10 years, um, biologics have started to come into play as well. And these are very targeted um, uh, molecules that target proteins that are involved in the inflammatory cascade. Uh, may have heard of some of their names, such as Remicade or Humira or Intivia or Stellara. And these medications have really been shown to be useful in terms of inducing remission and maintaining remission as well. So important point to note uh, is that each medication has its own possible side effects. And this is where your gastroenterologist can really come in handy in terms of figuring out what's the best uh, medication to try and how we can prevent any kind of issues that might occur with the medication. Usually before starting any kind of therapy, we'll do pre-testing evaluation, including lab work. We may check for chronic infections like TB or hepatitis. And even while on medication, we will probably do continual uh, monitoring for side effects and uh, blood work as well. Other important things to note is that while you're on these medications, you are at increased risk of infections because of a weakened immune system, and we ensure that you're up to date with vaccinations. And people who are on biologic therapy or immunosuppressants, we you have to ensure that they are not taking any kind of live vaccine. Uh, because of the immune system suppression. Uh, regular health screening is important for patients with inflammatory bowel disease. We recommend that they have skin cancer uh, evaluations. They undergo routine colon cancer screenings. Uh, for females, we, uh, we recommend annual pap smears. Um, other things are that for patients who've been on steroids for long term, they are at risk for osteoporosis, and we recommend that they undergo bone density scans. And smoking uh, and general health lifestyle is important because smoking can really aggravate uh, inflammatory bowel disease, leading to a more aggressive uh, disease pattern and even a higher need for potential need for surgery. Endoscopic management is also uh, something that can be done uh, from a gastroenterologist. The major indications for doing endoscopic management is to treat complications that, that can develop such as strictures. Uh, as we discussed, strictures usually are seen in Crohn's disease and they can involve any part of the GI tract including the small bowel or the large bowel. And they can cause abdominal pain, they can cause obstruction, they can lead to bloating. And there's two major uh, strictures that we usually see. One is a, we call it a fibrostenotic or basically a post-inflammation uh, scar tissue that can develop. Or we sometimes see after surgery that the um, anastomotic sites, the areas that are attached can develop uh, strictures as well. So, how do we, how do we manage this? And it, it, it's kind of a personalized approach. We have to look at multiple things, such as how big the stricture is, where the stricture is located, uh, any what are the potential complications we can deal with, and it can be seen. It can be done either endoscopically or it can even be done surgically. And this is where we use a multidisciplinary approach uh, and work with our colorectal surgeons to see what's which what is the best way to manage them. From an endoscopic standpoint, uh, some just some points to note is that usually if a stricture is of a shorter length, uh, less than five centimeters, if it's somewhere that is accessible from a colonoscope or an upper endoscope, those are the kind of strictures that can be managed endoscopically. Um, but if there's any issues, such as if there's a complication like an abscess or a fistula, if there's a suspicion for an underlying malignancy, then maybe a surgical approach might be um, a better way to go. Um, three to four patients can develop complications from endoscopic management. 
and these can include bleeding, uh, infection, and even um, in rare cases, perforation or tears of the small bowel. Colon stricture management is uh, another uh, uh, option we have. So in patients who develop strictures of the large bowel, we can place a metal tube uh, into the area and this slowly starts to expand and open up the colon and we leave it in for a few weeks to kind of help uh, dilate the area. This is good because in certain situations if patients are elderly or have multiple complications, undergoing a, a surgery can have its own risks. So this is kind of a minimally invasive way to help relieve obstructions that can develop. Thank you. That was, a, that was a very extensive and excellent presentation on a complex subject. Okay. So um, unfortunately, part of the management of inflammatory bowel disease involves surgery. Many patients will develop complications even with optimal medical treatment. As Dr. Khan has stated, this is a multidisciplinary approach. So it takes specialists in the medical field as gastroenterologists, but also surgeons become involved when necessary. The goal of the surgery, of course, is not curative, unfortunately. Even the medical treatment is not curative. We don't have a definitive diagnosis or reason for the disease to develop, why some people will develop Crohn's disease, why some people will develop ulcerative colitis. So cure, unfortunately, is not possible today. So we are managing symptoms and then relieving complications to improve quality of life. So with uh, the advances in medical treatment, uh, the incidence of needing surgery has certainly declined. But in the inflammatory bowel disease population, surgery is still fairly common. About 30% of patients will require some intervention uh, in their life. Most commonly, the reasons for this uh, is uh, the medications can have uh, side effects of their own and can become uh, less effective. When complications do develop and surgery is necessary, multiple studies have shown that with surgical intervention, these complications can be resolved and the quality of life of the patient improves significantly. So with Crohn's disease, uh, some of the more common uh, reasons to have surgery would be a perforation, a hole that forms in the intestine because of the severe inflammation. Toxic colitis is a state where the colon is so inflamed it loses its barrier function, bacteria leak out, and the patient can have an overwhelming infection, which we define as sepsis. And the inflammation can erode into blood vessels and cause bleeding. As stated, sometimes medical management is ineffective. Uh, in the pediatric population, growth can be inhibited. There can be a bowel blockage because of stricturing or narrowing of the colon because of the inflammation and the scar tissue that develops around it. These patients are at increased risk of cancer development because of the chronic inflammation. And particularly in Crohn's disease, the inflammation being full thickness can erode through the bowel wall, not cause a perforation or a free opening of the intestine, but something called a fistula, which is a communication uh, to other organs, possibly the skin, other portions of the bowel, or even the bladder or other organs such as that. So the emergencies that we deal with uh, certainly are less common, but again, a stated perforation, toxic colitis, severe bleeding. These are life-threatening emergencies. These patients are very sick and medical management obviously has failed. And so these are emergency situations. More commonly though, uh, surgery is discussed when medical options are exhausted. There are side effects uh, from the medication and particularly steroids, long-term steroids. If we are not able to wean them off because of continued disease, then 
surgery becomes something to discuss and consider. The most common reason for surgery in Crohn's disease is what we define as fibrosis, which is scar tissue that forms around the area of disease. A blockage is formed that is too wide to be dilated by the gastroenterologist. And so that area of the bowel has to be removed. Multiple recent studies have shown that people that present with this kind of presentation of Crohn's disease will have improved quality, quality of life for a longer period of time with upfront surgery, even before attempting medical management because the, the narrowing cannot be improved with the medical management. And so surgical removal of this area of narrowing uh, and then passing to maintenance therapy gives the best quality of life and long-term duration. Another consideration is the development of malignancy. With long-term inflammation, we know that the cancer risk certainly is increased. The average age of diagnosis in someone with inflammatory bowel disease is in the 50, early 50s, where in the general population, it's over 70. And where there is a stricture, the risk of malignancy is greatly increased. We discussed fistulas. This is kind of an artist rendition of what a fistula would look like. About 30% of patients will have fistulas with Crohn's disease around the anus. As you can see, the inflammation erodes through the wall of the anorectum and leads to communication into the soft tissue around the anus, and that can lead to abscess and fistula. These require surgical management. So ulcerative colitis presents with somewhat of a different nuance to surgical management. Crohn's disease being patchy, being full thickness, has its own complications such as the fistulae and the narrowing or stenosis. Ulcerative colitis is a more continuous inflammation that starts uh, in the anus and goes proximally, can involve the entire colon or portions of the left side of the colon, it depends. Again, most importantly, this requires multidisciplinary management. These patients have about a 30 year risk of requiring surgery. Most commonly, surgery is necessary for refractory colitis. In other words, the medication is not able to control the inflammation and the quality of life of the patient is compromised. So early surgical evaluation is of course important. We need to avoid prolonged steroids as best as possible because these will over time increase the risk of any eventual surgery. Also, of colitis being a more continuous inflammation, the risk of malignancy is greater than in Crohn's disease over time. The uh, lifetime risk of malignancy in a of an ulcerative colitis patient is about 3.7%. The longer the duration of the disease, the greater the risk of cancer. There are pre-malignant changes called dysplasia that also can be evaluated and potentially require surgery if it is high grade. Emergency surgeries, unfortunately, sometimes are required with ulcerative colitis. This is for severe disease. Again, you can have a perforation and toxic colitis. Whereas in Crohn's disease, we do more segmental or partial removals of intestine. Ulcerative colitis being a more continuous infl inflammatory process starting from the low rectum requires a more extensive surgery when it becomes necessary. A difference between Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis that is that ulcerative colitis is curable surgically. Ulcerative colitis involves only the colon and the rectum, whereas Crohn's disease can involve all aspects of the intestinal system from the mouth to the anus. So if someone with ulcerative colitis severe disease comes to surgery for malignancy or the other reasons that we discuss, the entire colon and rectum are removed. That will require a temporary, in most cases, stoma, which is an ileostomy, which is a portion of 
the small intestine, the last part of the small intestine that's brought through an opening in the abdominal wall, colon ileostomy, and the effluent, the digested material, uh, is gathered into a, what is called a bag or an appliance. There is the possibility to reconstruct a neorectum using the last portion of small intestine. It's called a J-pouch or ilioanal pouch anastomosis. This is a technically uh, challenging operation and one needs to have experience with this type of procedure. But this will reconstruct the rectum and allow for bowel continuity. Here at Virginia Hospital Center, our goal is to, when surgery becomes necessary for inflammatory bowel disease, to take a minimally invasive approach whenever possible, conserve bowel, of course, and offer uh, options that guarantee a more, a greater quality of life that, that is longer lasting. On that note, uh, I'd like to uh, discuss the our new digestive center, which is in uh, Fairfax at 3025 Hammaker Court. It's a wonderful new facility. Uh, Parking is excellent, access is excellent. We have the ability to have all of the specialists involved in the care of digestive disease patients, not just inflammatory bowel disease, come together uh, to optimally treat and manage complex patients, uh, such as the ones we're talking about today. We treat everything from gastrointestinal, colorectal, liver, pancreas, tumors and cancers, peptic ulcer disease, gallstone, irritable bowel disease, inflammatory bowel disease, reflux, hiatal hernia, stomach issues are all treated at the center. We have various specialties. The centerpiece, of course, is gastroenterology. These are the medical doctors uh, that manage these problems. And we have the adjunct of colorectal surgeons like myself, but also GI surgeons, bariatric surgeons, and also liver and pancreas surgeons. We all work together as a team and discuss the optimal management for each and every person that comes under our care. Thank you. Uh, I think we're open to questions. Yes, if anyone um, has any questions, please feel free to type them in the question um, box and we will get to them. I do have um, a couple here for you. Um, can someone be tested to determine if they are at risk for IBD? Um. <clears throat> To preemptively test without any symptoms is usually not how we uh, approach it. If patients have issues like chronic diarrhea or having bleeding, then we can do a stool specimen, which gives us uh, some information if there's any underlying inflammation. And that can be used almost as a screening tool. And if it does come back positive, then yes, we'll start to have to do further investigation with colonoscopy or endoscopy or even uh, imaging as well. All right, thank so, you. So, so there is a familial link uh, of inflammatory bowel disease in many cases. And so if someone has a strong family history with first degree relatives that have inflammatory bowel disease and they're concerned, they can certainly do the studies that Dr. Khan is talking about. There's some blood work that can be done as well. But really in the absence of symptoms, inflammatory bowel disease is unlikely, even with a strong family history. So there's no specific screening test for inflammatory bowel disease. I'm fine, and I'm, I'm worried that I have inflammatory bowel disease. Doesn't, it doesn't exactly work like that. Okay, thank you. Another question. So someone asked about the slides. Yes, so everyone is going to be getting um, a link to the webinar, so you'll have the slides. And then someone asked, what is the cancer probability for Crohn's? So 
Right. So the, that's in the slide. So the lifetime risk of uh, cancer is about 3.7%, which is a little bit higher than the general population. When cancer develops, it's earlier than in the general population. The longer the duration of the disease, the greater the risk of cancer. And when there is a stricture or a narrowing, particularly in the colon, then the cancer risk increases. And, and that is the limitation of doing managing longer strictures with dilatation and placing stents. It's a, it, you know, it's a, it raises a difficulty in surveillance and doing biopsies and seeing cancer develop and potential over time. Okay, thank you. Can Crohn's disease evolve into ulcerative colitis if it's not managed? Uh, usually, no. Uh, the disease, uh, the patterns of disease are different. Um, Crohn's disease, as I said, can involve any part of the GI tract and is usually involving the entire wall of the intestines, while ulcerative colitis is usually involving just the innermost layer. There are certain situations where uh, patients or, or clinicians may consider a disease to be ulcerative colitis. They undergo management or treatment, but then they start to see that there may be involvement in other parts. It may actually be Crohn's disease. Uh, so sometimes there can be an overlap in confusion which diagnosis is made. Okay, great. So, so the, the reason for that is that inflammatory bowel disease is a, is a spectrum of presentation and so at one end, we have Crohn's disease, patchy inflammation that is full thickness. At the other side of that spectrum, which is I imagine as a line, is ulcerative colitis that involves only the rectum and the colon. It's superficial inflammation and it's continuous, it's not patchy. But as you get to the middle of that line, there is a gray area where the manifestation of the inflammatory process begins to be indistinguishable between one and the other. They have aspects of both. And we call that indeterminate colitis or disease. And so when the inflammation involves the small intestine or the portions of the GI tract, then it is Crohn's disease. But in the colon, you can have Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. And many times it's difficult to distinguish. And that can be up to 10% of people with inflammatory colitis. And so that's why it can be difficult to make that, that, that determination. Another point that I'd like to also mention is that um, there are, have been cer certain situations where patients are given the label that, hey, you may have Crohn's disease or you may have ulcerative colitis, where in actuality they may have had a, an infection or some other kind of uh, digestive disease issue. And on repeat follow-ups, um, there's no signs of inflammation. These patients have not been on any kind of medical therapy. Um, and so sometimes, because as Dr. Rezak was saying, it can be a spectrum, some patients may be misdiagnosed as having inflammatory bowel disease when in actuality they don't. Absolutely. I agree with that. Thank you. Another question is, um, can you discuss um, diet restrictions for optimal health if you have these or are there certain ones? And I don't know, is there a difference between I'm I'm adding on to this question that the person asked. Is there a difference between dietary restrictions for someone um, with Crohn's versus ulcerative colitis? So so usually, so multiple studies have have looked at this, and unfortunately, there isn't anything uh, well defined or clear that diet can help. People go to more a more elemental or simple diet. Sometimes that can help. Most people with inflammatory bowel disease will be uh, lactose intolerant and so should avoid dairy, but that is not uh, a set rule. So, so diet can be beneficial, but to a certain point, the most important thing is ensuring proper nutrition. Yeah, and if patients have had um, surgeries to their large parts of their small bowel, then yes, maybe doing a more like a, a simpler diet that's easy to digest may be better. Um, so yeah, for otherwise there's no major restrictions in what you can or cannot eat. Okay, thank you. Um, another question: You discussed environmental and genetic risks leading to Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. Is stress a contributing factor? 
Well, we don't have enough evidence for that. Um, I'm sure generally in life, stress uh, can lead to a lot of different issues. But as far as from the studies that we have seen, um, I can't really comment if stress is a major risk factor for inflammatory bowel disease. So not necessarily causing the disease, but worsening or provoking a flare, there are certainly links between emotional stress and flares of inflammatory bowel disease, without question. But stress does not cause inflammatory bowel disease. The cause of inflammatory bowel disease is complex, not well-defined as we've discussed, but we are making headway. So we have identified various genes that can be inherited, of course, that are linked to inflammatory bowel disease. And then there are environmental factors, clearly, that play a role. Certain bacteria have been linked to the development of inflammatory bowel disease and other intestinal parasites as well. Okay. All right. Another question. What's the most uh, recent research in treating IBS and Crohn's with probiotics like, oh, let's see if I can read this right, Acarmanesia, did I say that right? A C A K K E R M A N S I A. Either of you want to take that on? I, I can answer that. That's fine. So, um, so we we know that the uh, the biome of the gut plays a significant role in inflammatory bowel disease. And there have been studies that show a significant benefit to people with inflammatory, not IBS, that is irritable bowel syndrome. That's not what we're talking about today. But inflammatory bowel disease has a benefit with specific probiotic therapies. Probiotics are the healthy bacteria that we require to be healthy, to coat the gut and help us. We have seen that in inflammatory bowel disease patients, this bacterial makeup, flora, if you will, population in the gut becomes imbalanced. And studies have shown, particularly with probiotics, a specific formula called VHS-13 can be helpful. Yeah, and I don't think the acromanesia uh, might not fall into that. The, the other thing I want to do mention is that the gut microbiome is something that's now starting to become more and more, we're starting to do more and more research into this. And slowly and steadily, we're trying to see, um, trying to gain a better understanding of what's the most optimal bacterial populations for our gut. Um, there have been some studies where people even tried to do stool transplants to patients to see if we could try to repopulate uh, the entire bacterial population for inflammatory bowel disease. But right now, we don't have enough evidence that any of these things are uh, pr providing major significance for inflammatory bowel. Right. Unfortunately, the uh, stool transplant studies have shown no benefit for that, for controlling the inflammation. Uh, they are very helpful in certain infectious states in the colon. Okay, great. Thank you guys both so much. I want to end with, and, and Robin, I'm going to ask you if you don't mind coming back on, um, if you could just kind of give an overview of our, you know, our Digestive Health Center. I know Dr. Rizek talked about it a lot, but maybe if you could kind of talk about this last slide and kind of the reasoning behind VHC putting together this, what I think is, is just such a great program for our community. Sure, happy to, Kathy. So, um, as the doctors discussed, the, the incidence, the prevalence of GI issues t continues to grow both domestically and internationally. And we really saw an opportunity within the Northern Virginia market to really bring our GI doctors together with our colorectal surgeons, with our liver, our hepatobiliary, and our GI general surgeons. Um, under one roof to really um, discuss patients, to manage patients. As Dr. Rizek said, let's go less invasively, let's medically manage them. And then if medical management 
uh, fails and we need to progress treatment, there's an opportunity to really thread the needle so that a patient can really be seen and managed um, under one roof with a group of clinicians who li literally can, can talk and discuss the management and treatment of a patient. Um, and so it's really making sure that our patients are well seen. We offer that continuum of care. It's convenient. And um, it really ensures that all of the labs, the testing, any of the follow-up can really be done to ensure that these patients are treated and managed um, as effectively as possible so that, as, uh, so that their quality of life can, can improve um, and be managed uh, despite the, uh, the diagnosis. So um, yeah, we're excited to start this program. We've got a great cadre of, of clinicians and uh, yes, we are in Fairfax and uh, folks may make their appointments either online or call the, uh, the appointment or schedule an appointment um, in the, the URL that's listed here on the left of the slide. So again, I want to take this opportunity to thank our, our clinicians um, and the teamwork that they continue to demonstrate, because that's really in the best interests of our, of our community and our patients who we manage. Great. Thank you uh, again, Dr. Uh, Khan and Dr. Rizak, for that awesome presentation. And just a reminder again to everyone, especially those who may be logged in a little bit late, you will be probably midweek next week be um, receiving a link to the recording. So feel free to share that with any family friends that you think may benefit or be interested. So thank you everyone and have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for having us. Thank you.